Thank you very much. Um, I'm pretty sure this is the first time that the president, provost, and dean have uh, had a conversation about me in which the phrase pain in the ass uh, was not mentioned, uh, uh, for which I'm grateful, uh, uh, although I'm sure, sure that is not a forecast of future behavior. Um, and uh, so, yeah, today's prize does um, compensate a bit for my disappointment at the Oscars two years ago. <laughs> uh, th there's no prize for best behavioral economist, which I think is unfair, uh, a topic I've studied at, at some length. Um, so I, I don't really intend to give a speech. This isn't the Oscars. Uh, thanking everybody would take forever. Um, I had many, many co-authors uh, on my papers. Two that I should uh, mention in particular, one is Cass Sunstein, who was our colleague here for many years, a uh, good friend and um, co-author of Nudge. Uh, the other is Shlomo Benarzi, um, who is better than anyone else at getting me to work. Um, so I have more papers with him uh, than with anyone else. Um, you know, the experience of being a Booth faculty member is uh, one of tough love. Um, the behavioral science group, it's a little less tough, but only a little. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been good to be here all these, these 20 years, um, arguing with uh, guys like Fama. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's good for me. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, we now try to keep our arguments to the golf course, but Gene is in such a hurry that it's hard to, to get in much of an argument. Um, I, just thanks to everybody. That's all. All right, thank you. We have a little um, stage business to do here, but I just wanted to, um, to let people know that there'll be some opportunities in the coming weeks and months for the university community to celebrate uh, this award at greater length. Um, in the meantime, today, uh, we are honored to have some representatives from the international media uh, that have come here today, and we've promised them a chance to uh, ask some questions, so we'll provide that opportunity in just a second. Um, there are a couple of microphones uh, for media to ask questions, but if you can't get one, for the benefit of the webcast audience, I'll do my best to uh, repeat the questions so everyone can hear. So with that, any questions from the media? Me yeah, media questions. Uh, but I'm not allowed to reveal her location. <laughs> Another question. W one question. One at a time. <laughs> uh, so, so, I, so where were you when the call came in? So I was uh, um, asleep, very much asleep. Uh, the call came at four this morning. Uh, my wife's here, she can attest to that. Um, um, they, they say, whatever you do, don't tell anybody for the next hour. Like, there's a lot of people that are awake waiting, <laughs> wait, waiting for your call. I, um, and uh, then they 
ask you to participate in a press conference uh, that they have in Stockholm, assuming you've accepted, uh, which, which I did. And, and uh, un unlike Bob Dylan, I do plan to go to Stockholm. So, so thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the media? Uh, yes. So the question is about getting mainstream economists to uh, accept your theories and, and behavioral. Yeah, I think uh, you used the word embrace. Uh, I would say impossible. Uh, embracing, economists don't do a lot of embracing, actually. <laughs> uh, psychologists are more like the hugging, the hugging type than, than economists. Um, you know, I always say that I don't think I've uh, changed anybody's mind in, uh, the, in 40 years. Um, you, you basically don't change anybody's mind. Um, you, so given that, I've, just, I've used the strategy of corrupting the youth. <laughs> and uh, whose, whose minds are not already made up. And uh, so I think young economists, uh, many great young economists have embraced behavioral economics. Um, some are full-time practitioners. Uh, others are just people who write things up. They let the data speak. Um, and the growth of the field is really due to the, the work of the people that followed me. Um, let me. Let me mention a couple. Two were on our faculty early in their careers, George Lowenstein and Colin Kammerer. Um, and they were, they didn't really need to be converted they, they had, uh, uh, Colin was a student here and then returned as a faculty member. Um, and then people like David Labson, Matthew Rabin, Senda Mulanathan, um, I'm, if I go on, I'm gonna insult more. So the, all the people I'm leaving out, um, just blame my bad memory. Um, you know, we had this uh, Russell Sage Foundation. We started a summer camp for graduate students in 1994. In fact, I was wearing my camp T-shirt this morning when it says quasi-rational on the front of it. <laughs> um, uh, two of the students at that first camp were Labson and Sendel, and Matthew Rabin was sort of counselor in training, and uh, Labson and Rabin have been teaching the camp for the last decade, and uh, that's where the field was, was really created. I think it was Danny's idea to, uh, to start that camp, and um, I still go. It's a lot, of, a lot of fun. No marshmallows, but beer. <laughs> Next question. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, my acting without Selena there is not as good. Um, and it, well, let me say the following. I've uh, already, and I'll preempt one question that uh, some reporter may ask. Uh, and that I've answered a couple times this morning. Um, economists, uh, uh, and uh, Lars and Jean, I'm sure were asked this question, which is, so what are you gonna do with the money? <laughs> now, most economists are too polite to explain that they think that this is a stupid question. <laughs> and 
the, the reason why they think it's a stupid question is that economists know that money is fungible. And so what do you mean this money? So if uh, I go out to dinner, is it this money or some other money? <laughs> so um, th this is, now this isn't a completely stupid question to me since I believe in something called mental accounting, uh, which is precisely people putting labels on money. And um, so what am I going to do with the money? Uh, what is left? <laughs> um, is I, I, any time I spend any money that's really fun, I'm going to say that came from the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so we'll have time for a couple more questions, and then there'll be an opportunity uh, after the main, main event is over. But next question, uh, yeah. Uh, well, since Cass and I wrote the book Nudge, um, right after that, David Cameron had read the book. Uh, one of his young team had bought a, a bunch of copies and piled them up in a place where Cameron would see them and be nudged uh, <laughs> to read one. And um, they wrote in their manifesto, which is like a party platform, that if elected, they would apply behavioral science to public policy. And being used to American politics, I, I would, knew about this, but never expected anything to happen. Uh, but they, they take their manifestos uh, seriously there. So they created this behavioral insight team. It was about six people originally. Um, I've spent a lot of time with them over the years. Uh, they're now, all, that group is over 100. And according to the World Bank, there are now 75 such units around the world. So it's happening. Um, what, what are they doing? Um, you, you know, <coughs> when, when I was first working with that team and I would go around talking to various ministers, I kept uttering the phrase, if you want to get people to do something, make it easy. Uh, this is old wisdom from psychology, from Kurt Lewin, remove barriers. And uh, so this, I said it often enough, it sort of became the team mantra. And so w one of the things these teams do is try and make it easier for people to achieve their goals. So an example that we wrote about in Nudge was one of the hardest things students tell us about applying to college is the student loan form. Now the government gives the loans. What is the information they need? It's tax returns. Who has the tax returns? The government. And uh, kids often have divorced parents who may not be all that interested in sharing their tax returns with one another, but the government has all the information. So we argued for what they call pre-populating these forms uh, and doing that increases applications to college. So uh, this is an example of you know, the lightest possible form of nudge. Um, just making it easier to fill out an application, that'll encourage people to, to get more education, and we think that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I, should, I just shouldn't go there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that the obvious answer, I can think of pros and cons. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just would say everybody here should read that chapter about the offices, and no harm can come of that. <laughs> and, um, uh, but, yeah, people in, in business and government, I think, can, uh, can learn useful, uh, useful ideas and skills from, you know, what, what have I done? I basically have made a career stealing ideas from psychologists. And uh, you can save the trouble of learning from the psychologist directly just by looking what I've stolen. So. All right. Well, there will be some more availability um, now, but I think uh, we'd like to thank everyone once more uh, for coming today. Thank you very much. Thank you.